Am I allowed to ask you controversial questions? No. My dad is like, her? No, she's mixing hair cream. <laughs> like, what the hell? Like, I didn't think I was going to get here. It was so crazy that even we sold the car. The entrepreneurship journey, although I say I stumbled into it, I think it's been a rewarding one. This is a sentence, actually. It says is that when you have good thoughts, good ideas, you will find people who will come around you to reason with you. Yeah. I grew up with brothers. So we're climbing tree, you know, and you all kinds of that. I wrote tire with stick. <laughs> you do wheel and spoke. <laughs> did wheel and spoke. All. <laughs> I initially started off wanting to be a medical doctor. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to be that. And I was like, oh my God, see this child. They want to embarrass That's a grown you woman. <laughs> a grown woman. I want to see a grown woman run around. <laughs> Imagine it, uh, a Nigerian father who has been telling everybody in Nigeria that he just has really met. And then while he was chewing down his favorite meal, like, go to the So I no, almost choked. Not everything to <laughs> I have evidence that I was in camp. I have yeah. pictures. I even climbed the, you climb uh, the rope. And so I used the money to buy my first stock of human hair. Man, I was selling from the boot of my car. So I started manufacturing my products, those products in America first. That was when I knew that I had structure. So you have lock up. For you. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I'm looking into the camera and saying, yes, I will not be having any more children. <laughs> Hello everybody and once again, welcome to the Entrepreneurs Connect show. Of course, you know, this show is about African entrepreneurs sharing their stories. So basically, you get to learn a lot of lessons from them, telling you about their experiences, their journey, their failure, their successes, and everything in between. And as always, we are keeping it real here. Welcome to another lovely episode and I cannot wait to get started because today i have a phenomenal guest in the house somebody you all would love to listen to somebody i want to learn from in this particular episode without wasting much of your time much of my time as well and much of her time <laughs> <laughs> let us welcome irogama i'm very well thank you thank you for having me on your show thank you for coming <laughs> this is like second coming <laughs> <laughs> i'm not jesus but okay <laughs> Thank you for coming uh, once again. So, like I've said before, this is going to be real quick. We're just going to have a conversation around everything you've done business-wise and maybe a little of a personal life mm -hmm. just to have that mix. Okay. Am I allowed to ask you controversial questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want us to trend. No. You don't want them to drag us no. on, on blogs. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Um, Grace, uh, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Once again, and I want to commend you for not being inaccessible. You were, uh, that's not like sarcasm, is it? You were. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not like it's not it's, it's, it's not like sarcasm. Yeah, you are not inaccessible. You're you're actually approachable. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Let me put it like this: somebody has to approach you to know that you're approachable. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good to have some mystery and some boundaries. True. Yeah. True. So keep that, the crazies away. So that every time they can hurry doesn't Exactly. Just you know, so you have to test first to be sure whether you can step. And you know, also even in the being approachable, it's also measured, right? Um mm. Mm. I I I I'm not approachable to everybody. Of course. I'm not accessible to everybody and I don't think I should be and it's not really because of what I do or who I am but I think everybody that's should, how life, life should, should be, be. Yeah. Yeah. everybody no matter who you are should have certain boundaries mm -hmm. that certain people should not be able to cross mm. good so I'm happy to hear that I was you found me accessible even though I mean it was on the fourth try but you know <laughs> it could have been seven you know seven is special number so since it was four I mean it was it was good it wasn't too bad it wasn't too bad <laughs> all right Welcome to the show, um, Irogama. Thank you. I was going to ask you, what was the meaning of your name? Yorama Namie Nagbazoi. Do you know how to speak your language very well? No, I don't. Because Please, I, mean, I can only pronounce, pronounce my it, name. Yes, I can pronounce. If I cannot pronounce my name, I might receive a conk from my father, <laughs> spiritually, <self. laughs> from the spiritual the realm. So, it is deep, deep. Yeah, so I had to learn. But um, it means good thoughts, uh, good ideas. And mm. basically, what that sentence is a sentence actually me says is that when you have good thoughts, good ideas, you will find people who will come around you to reason with mm. you. Yeah. And awesome. it looks like this name is following you. In fact, Everywhere my life is a testimony or a testament to my name. 
Mm-hmm. I think I think my life has definitely been a reflection of what my name means. It's been, it's it has manifested itself um, very clearly um, in my life. Yeah. Oh, what was growing up like for you? Growing up as a tomboy, I grew up with brothers. I grew up with brothers, so I mean, I had to I had to forget that I was a girl. You have a sister right now. I have sisters. You have sisters. I have sisters. I have two older sisters, but they live abroad. I have oh. younger sisters who are much younger than I am. So when you look at the closest siblings to me in no, terms we're, of we're before me and after me, the boys. So certainly all the games were their kind of games. You know, all the kinds of play mm-hmm. were the kinds of play that boys would be, you know, indulging. You're not necessarily going to be playing. Um, tea parties and yeah. with dolls and things Nobody like that. Princess. So we're climbing trees, we're hanging upside down from the swing sets, we're rolling tire, you know, you and all kinds of tire. Road tire with stick. <laughs> you do wheel and spoke. Did wheel and spoke. <laughs> all, uh, rode my bicycle roughly, uh, fought on the floor, mm, ran around without shirts, like or like the boys, uh, forgetting that uh, even I mean there was nothing there at that age, football? but. I, t- I tried, I attempted, at least I used to try to kick the ball, even though I missed the leg would cross, but at least I was on the field. That was what was important. I was on the field. I was in, I was in play. I was in play. Yes, that was what was critical. I was part of the boys. Um, and it's quite interesting that I, I had that kind of a background because who knew that I would end up growing up and having to work in fields that were dominated by men mm. you know so i don't feel out of place i mean you're busting it right now yeah uh, i don't feel out of place i don't feel intimidated in fact i'm feeling at home you know like i've been playing with the boys so this is not like new territory for me so i'm comfortable do do people first give you like you, you go into an audition or something and because you're a woman the first one to you're yeah, even going fast. Eh? What about when I make phone calls? Maybe because my voice is deep. Mm. I can make a call. I want the people to say, Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> sometimes I correct, sometimes I don't even bother. I just carry on. You know, I'm like, This is your husky voice now. Wow. <laughs> and then um, when I send emails, as uh, I, I, now I understand why a lot of women do he, you know, they do the she, she. stroke her yeah. in their, even yeah, in their bio. email signature. Oh, really? Yeah. Even in the email signature, you now see she stroke her because you send an email, and maybe because of your designation, the person who's responding, who's never met you before, doesn't know who you are, just feels they now reply mind. and say, Dear Mr. So, so, so person because they, maybe they've looked at your profile and they think it's probably a man and maybe you don't have an obviously female name yeah and so they now assume that you're a man so now i understood why a lot of women today actually include their gender in their email signature so very interesting so yes we get that but uh, we just keep pushing uh, whether man or woman let's get the work done and let's get the deal sealed that's what's important so, you know. did um, you ever at any points growing up see yourself like becoming an entrepreneur running businesses and all that no no i didn't i saw myself as a career professional Mm. i initially started off wanting to be a medical doctor when i was a teenager and primarily because my mom is a medical doctor Mm. um and i I guess i just wanted to be like my mom like many kids you know growing up uh but she but then there was a conflict because i I, I, I'm afraid of needles and I'm afraid of the sight of blood. I don't like to see blood. So, so my mom wondered how till I was, now. till now. You, so when I want to get a shot or I want to anyone um, now, <laughs> but obviously now I'm not embarrassed myself. That like, I remember when I was traveling with my my daughters this summer and we needed to treat for um, malaria, but one mm. of them was actually ill. So she was taking shots, but I wanted to treat for malaria before the trip and I wanted, I didn't want to take tabs. So the doctor said, okay, we're going to give you shots. So my daughter was like, okay, mommy, you take... I want to watch you take your shot. But she had to take a shot. She's like, I want to watch you take your shot, then I'll take my shots without running away. And I was like, oh my God, see this child. They want to embarrass That's a grown you woman. Up. A grown woman. I want to see a grown woman run around and have them hold her down. So I had to chest it mm. and position and take that shot. And then she was like, okay, mommy could do it. Then I could do it with my head. I was like, God, help me. <laughs> So it was an experience, but yes, that's how terrified I am of needles. So to the point where if I'm taking that, they drain my blood, I have to look away, mm. I have to squeeze something. It's not really because of the pain, it's the fear. It's crazy because in our minds, anyways. But yeah, that's how terrified. You can imagine being younger, how much more terrified I was. So my mom couldn't understand how I would marry the two, but I mean, she wasn't going to burst my dreams and tell me that I couldn't do it. She yeah. just felt you could be whatever you want to be, but in her mind, she's like, this girl's not going to be a doctor. <laughs> like, she, she, she's playing around. So anyways, I went to school, and thankfully, I thank the American system because the American system is such that you do a first degree, 
in anything, uh, but take some core courses that lead up to your, then you do a, like a professional degree afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you don't just go right into law school or right into medical school. Mm -hmm. like you have to do like a pre-med, like a pre-law degree, and then go to law school kind mm -hmm. of thing. So that's how the, you know, the, the, their system is structured. So while I went in for biology and psychology, I'm pre-med with the pre-med track. So pr taking classes that would um, count towards now getting admitted into medical school eventually. Mm. But by like second year, I was like, man, this medical school is not, not medical in <laughs> It's not medical in at all. I don't think that it's going to work. So I knew that I would not be going doing medicine. And then my older sister was also in medical school by that time. I saw her struggles. I saw like what it entailed. I was like, man, this, I don't think I'm that focused mm -hmm. <laughs> to go through this journey. It's long. It's a long journey. And uh, I just didn't have that interest or commitment. So I had to draw the balls and tell my dad that I would um, I wasn't going to do medical school anymore. What was his reaction? Oh, uh, imagine it. Uh, a Nigerian father who has been telling everybody in Nigeria that he just has really medicine. He did not even understand the, pre, the concept of pre-med and the medical school. In his head, I am already in the medicine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm He's waiting to medicine. call you doctor once hmm. you come up. Then I'm not telling him that I want to do public health. And then pu public health was just like an emerging field. It wasn't really very popular. And, you were f and it was more of medical professionals going into public health. Mm -hmm. So you weren't really seeing non-medical professionals um, getting med um, public health degrees at that time. So my dad was like, what is public health? Who knows that can get a job with that? I mean, I've spent all this money in front of public health. So it was a bit of a thing. But I took him to dinner and broke the news to him. So since I'd already been thinking strategically from that time, I had to take him to dinner very in his favorite restaurant in Boston. Mm. And then while he was chewing down his favorite meal, I broke the news. So I no, almost I'm choked. Sorry, I'm choke. I did <laughs> choke, Sha, because you couldn't have choked, but you uh, might have choked. What, that what was a risk. Say? That what? was a big risk now that I think about it. But at least it it went down a bit better because he was eating his favorite steak mm. when I was telling him. I was paying for the meal too, so he wasn't having to pay. Um, but it was, I mean, at the end of the day, my dad has always been a supporter. Mm. Um, he didn't like it, but he understood it and he decided to support me, whatever it meant. And it looked like I, I knew what I was doing. And so at that point, I just, my dream was, oh, I would come back to Nigeria and maybe I would work with like the Ministry of Health because I went on to do a master's in public health. Mm, really? Yes, so the um, health policy and the management track. So my plan was I would come back and I wanted to be involved in the development of policies and then also their implementation. Yeah. And I wanted to do it within the, you know, like I have to do it within the government space or like a WHO space or something. So I came back, I did uh, some internships, that, that internship sort of cross crossed with working with state government. Mm -hmm. I had a not so nice experience and I was very, very, um, what's the word? I was very optimistic. I mean, that's not the word I'm looking for. That word where you're in like in a utopian world where I felt like there was a lot of ide idealism. Yeah. So things would go the way they're meant to go. And then I had that rude awakening, like, no, darling, things don't go the way they're meant to go. It's really not like, in Nigeria. Welcome to Nigeria. Exactly. Sis. So I was quite disappointed because I felt healthcare was and the health and, and the health industry was so that was something that was so Delicate. critical that mm -hmm. you couldn't be playing politics with it you know but then i have grown up a lot since then and faced some realities i mean also. everything goes yeah from so when you're driving on the road Zef, you feel like people should know that i should not come to your front like this <laughs> the worst one is roundabouts i don't think that nigerian drivers know uh, the rules of the roundabouts who has the right of way in the roundabouts uh, nobody know. wants to wait no no no, no 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 <laughs> Nobody wants to eat. So I, uh, I, I, so I, so I now decided, and while I was doing my youth service, trying to figure out what next for me. I had two degree. I had this uh, first degree in uh, mass and um, public in biology and psychology, and I had this public health masters coming up. Yeah. I, I, that's when I got into business. Where did you serve? In Abuja. Don't ask me which company, but I served <laughs> in Abuja. <laughs> Please don't come and spoil my future ministerial uh, opportunity. <laughs> I get it. What well, was service? I'm like just joking. For I'm you, just though. joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did youth service. I really did it. I have my certificates. <laughs> what was camp like? Yeah. What is wrong with you now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have evidence that I was in camp. I have yeah. pictures. I even climbed the you climbed uh, those, rope and everything. Yes. Uh, so camp, I had this really, I, I had this really interesting. Um, a uh, military officer who used to wake us up and drill us. He was mm. a drilling officer. And then I participated in the, in the uh, beauty pageant. They had a beauty pageant. 
and I represented my group of, of what was your it platoon. My platoon. So I was like, and I mean, I didn't do so badly. I think I came third. Then my friend who came from Boston with me, who all um, went to school in Boston as well, Buffy. Actually, he was really buff. Ah, Buffy was really buff. Buffy, I think he didn't even win. Self. He also represented his platoon. And he came out, so he came reflecting his, his chest muscle and everything. But it was quite interesting. It was an interesting time. <laughs> So these are good memories of mm. camp. I mean, that's how many years ago. It just feels like a lifetime away. But, but yeah, so I, then I went, I, I started doing my business. What was, was the first doing? business you started? Welcome to Kaizen Digital Academy, your one-stop African platform for online education. At Kaizen, we are built for the African market, teaching people how to make money online using high-income digital skills. Do you want to learn and implement faster? Do you want to increase your earning capacity and gain digital skills? Then visit kaizenacademy.co, create an account with us today and voila, you are on your way to making your dreams come through with Kaizen, the African school of digital skills. So that's when I actually started Heaven. So I started Heaven in 2009, mm -hmm. January. Wow. Well. Yeah. I have been to our 9th January and we started off selling hair extensions. And this started off in the way that I, I had envisioned it and what had birthed it in the, in the first instance. But the initial plan was that uh, I saw a gap amongst my friends who had moved back. So a lot of, of my friends and people that I acquaintances moved back to Nigeria around the same time that I did. So these are the people who graduated from secondary school like 2002, you know, they're finished school, they're all now moving back to the youth service. Mm -hmm. So many of them moved back to Abuja and they were in law school and doing all kinds of things. And when we would gather on weekends, you know, when everybody was taking a break from uh, whether service or law school or whatever, we would be discussing and most of the complaints were how they couldn't find good quality hair extensions. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the very expensive ones, yeah. like the human hair, or the antifumi and all of that, but even just like things like then it was premium two, premium now, uh, those were like the brands that were in these packets, but mm. you wanted the, the um, original one. Yeah. So you'd walk around the whole of Wuse Market, and after you have walked around Wuse Market, you still end up buying the fake. Mm. So there was a lot of complaints around that. And I saw an opportunity there. Like, hmm, what, what if I set up a beauty supply store and import these products? Where have you played around that space before, ever? I had never played around this place. Cool. I've always been one to get into places. I'm just a businesswoman, to be yeah. honest. I'm just an entrepreneur. I see opportunity, it's going to add value. I, I will go after it. So I, so I decided I was going to do it. And so I started building my business plan. And of course, I went to the only angel investor I knew, which was my father. <laughs> oh, daddy, I have a great idea. He said, oh, my daughter, that's great. Awesome. But I need to see a business plan. And I need to see a financial model. So even as early as 2008, you drew a financial I was model. already working on business plans and financial models. So I went, thank God, for Google. Google was my friend and still remains my friend to mm. today. Well, now we have chat GPT, so I'm kind of losing it from Google, but yeah, anyways, I digress. So I went to, I got a business plan and a financial model, my startup course, and I submitted it to my dad. And he evaluates it, he calls me in for a meeting. It was very serious. Like, he wasn't joking with me. I mean, this was my first this official like a business. Pitch. Yes. <laughs> And then he asked us, asked me this, you know, I pitched to him, I'm passionate, I'm like, I'm going to do it and it's going to do well. I've, I've even seen the shop, you know, I just mm. went in the store. I had already identified where we're going to do the. So it started in Abuja? It was supposed to be in Abuja. Mm -hmm. And then he now asked me, mind you, me, I had admission to go to, back to school for September after youth service. So I finished selling him this great idea and everything. And then he just asked me one question. He said, So when you finish doing all these beautiful things you, and you go to school, what happens to the business? Mm. Do you know, I had not even thought past March or when I should have set up. I hadn't even thought about what he was asking me. Yeah. I hadn't considered it. And that was like a wake-up call. Like, you're not really ready to do this. So he said, so he saw how, like, chest falling I was. I was just like, oh, man, that means I'm not going to do this. And I really wanted to do it. So he said to me, well, I don't really, I cannot give you money to go and rent a store because I don't think you have a plan that would make the business sustainable. But here is what I can give you. And he gave me some amount of money. Like, see, wherever where that can take you. So this is your business idea. Good luck. I almost wanted to reject the money because it was this can even you can't even pay rent you can't even do this that's what I was saying in my head, so I was the, the person I was seeing at the time when I went back to complain about it. I just imagine if he wants to help me, manager help me, and, you know, <laughs> kind of, this is just kind of partial help. Is this? But the guy was just like you said, don't be ungrateful, don't be an ungrateful child. Mm -hmm. You've gotten a seed. He said this is a seed. Yeah. So whatever he can do for you, do it. And that's how I started. 
China discovered that women were beginning to get into the fad of human hair extensions. So I used the money to buy my first stock of human hair. So you're doing from home Brazilian or how are you running? Man, I was selling from the boot of my car. I would drive to wherever. I would mm. wear my products then. I would just, I forgot. I'm sure if I go look at my pictures from 2008, 2009, oh my goodness, on Facebook, because Facebook is the blessing of photo storage. Memories and all that, yeah. Like you'd see me literally modeling my products, my wares, and oh. that's how I was I was selling. And people were ordering from around the country because I was using Facebook. And uh, I was sending it, selling it to them wherever they were. So when even when I went back to school to do my masters in London, I had a friend, I made a friend in Abuja. So I handed every my product, my stuff on my to phone her. to her. So oh, wow. we now had a sharing formula. Oh, I have to give her a shout out, Asha. Asha was kept that business going. Shout too. out to Asha. Shout out to Asha. Come on. Shout out to Asha, Asha Bey, she was awesome. And so she would take the calls and she would, you know, fill the orders. And then when we get paid, I'll give her, we'll share the profits kind of thing. She kept that going for me. And somewhere in between while I was in London, I now um, started thinking about products that mm -hmm. would care for the hair extensions I was selling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went into like um, put, um, selling products for hair extensions and then coming up with my own formula. And this was like new terrain for you too? Yes. Crazy. So I started manufacturing my products, those products in America first, and then I moved to South Africa. And then at that point, as I evolved into product manufacturing, I decided to step away from hair extensions. Oh. Yeah, that's why we don't sell hair extensions till today. So today you don't today, sell hair extensions you know, we never anymore. went back to hair extensions. So because I realized that most of my, um, my target markets for my hair care products were also selling hair vendors. So I didn't want them to be stuck with the fact that I was a hair vendor as well and not be able to get my sales message about mm -hmm. my products mm -hmm. because they were seeing me as competition. Mm -hmm. So I had to make a, a, a business decision. So I dropped the hair extension um, um, line and then I just focused on my hair care products. And then we, so we, we, we manufactured that, we launched it. Um, and you know, and the rest they say is history. Today we have four salons, three in Portaco, one in Port in Lagos. We have a spa in Portacourt. Uh, we are on track to setting up a cosmetic manufacturing plant that will take us oh. back to you know producing our products again and producing for other people. So I mean, you know, um, the entrepreneurship journey. Although I say I stumbled into it, I think it's been a rewarding one. Crazy. Yeah, really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when I was looking you up. I, I saw that you were the winner of Next Titan, mm, yeah. season one. Let's talk about that for a bit. What was the experience like for you? <laughs> I'd like to also shout out someone, you know, who, for I can't tell that story without both of them. One, Zolomon, mm -hmm. Zolomon Wuche. He um, actually was the one who told me about the Next Titan. He's a friend of mine. And this was in 2012, while I was in the heat of trying to get my NAFDAQ. Uh, my NAFDAQ uh, numbers for my products, mm -hmm. you know, and I was really busy. And then this show and all of that, they were coming, they were bringing the audition was coming to Port Harcourt and blah blah blah. So he was applying for it, and then he just mentioned it to me that, like, I think you should try apply. The prize then was five million naira and a brand new car. If that, that was a lot then, yeah, yeah, it was a big deal, 2012. So he was like, Why don't you apply? In my head, I'm like, Reality TV show, me, I mean. <sighs> After you're thinking about like Big Brother, all this type of yeah. nonsense, uh, yeah, my yama shows, you're like, ah, how, how my family take it, I'll be on TV, I'll be in the house, and all of that. What's that? <laughs> it just didn't seem to fit my profile, yeah. So I brushed him up, but he was very persistent, like, he just go for the audition. He had not even got it, he didn't just go for the audition. So he pushed me to apply. So at the time when I applied, it was when I now told my, um, my family members, uh, about. My, told my dad really yeah. that ah, I've applied for this reality but it's a business show I was not tying into Donald Trump's The Apprentice I'm like it's like The Apprentice you know so it's a really professional <laughs> show it's a, like a serious show <laughs> you have to sell him on his first it. so he was like well you haven't gotten in yet when we get to that bridge you know, we'll cross it so mm -hmm. let's be watching so I applied and then we went we were shortlisted for the physical interview yeah. audition so we went for the audition we held in the old Abar Road what's the name of that hotel and went and you know went through the audition and then I got in. I got into top fifty mm. from around the country. So the next was now come to Lagos and do the boot camp. So do the boot camp for I think two days in, 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 in La Campagne, Tropicana. And then after that we're gonna select the top sixteen, eight girls and eight men eight men and eight women mm. who now move into the house and stay for three months, over a three months period before the winner would emerge. So I made it to the boot camp, 
and then after the two weeks you do different activities different competitions during the boot camp different mm-hmm. pitches uh group as a group and also as individual mm. and then they now announced they now had an unveiling for the top 16. so i went for the top for the unveiling and then i made it into the, the top how did you the, feel I don't know how I felt to be honest because I think I was scared shit like what the hell like I didn't think I was gonna get here it was just a case of don't be a quitter mm-hmm. you know get to the point but I don't think that I really really went like oh I'm going to get it to the point I don't think so you know so I was a bit surprised I was happy of course who doesn't like to win you know so I was happy that I made it called my family and because immediately they unveiled we went straight into the house there was oh, no wow. there was going no home, home no no because they told us everybody pack your things you know, I think they wanted that whole effect of you come and then if you don't get in and you carry your box, you know, back and all of that <laughs> stuff. So it was like pack your things and come. So once you decide you enter the bus, you're going to your house, going to the house. Mm. So I had to call my parents. And then once you're going to the house, you're leaving your phones. Yeah, so that when you get to the house, you drop your phones. You only have your phones on weekends, I think on Saturdays or so. Wow. So during the week, you don't have access to your phone. So I had to extract my directory. I had to call my family, let them know that I made it, I was going in and all of that. So I think the bug the excitement bug so they now caught it like oh, okay this is just it. we never had this kind of so thing they're now watching you every week oh yeah they're watching me every week so the show was airing every weekend i was on billboards it was really interesting i won't lie it was a, quite an experience 12 weeks mm. first of all you don't know that you're going to last the 12 weeks right mm-hmm, you could have mm-hmm. been out the first week mm-hmm. so I got, I got in and i think honestly um, one of the judges when i was going in i went to meet him it was the audition judge after i got into top 16 so I approached him, thanked him, and then I said to him, does he have any advice for me as I'm going to the house? What would he tell me that I could, you know, that would give me an edge? And I was expecting to hear, like, really philosophical advice, you know, like really deep insight. Yeah. And all this man said to me is, I pray for wisdom. Hmm. Like, that's what my pastor says. Like, oh, I want, like, <laughs> I want, like, you know, like, I want the... You want you them to tell you, focus, put yeah, your head down. Yeah, you know, like, I wanted the, <laughs> even with the rhyming and everything, you know, the very motivational speech. <laughs> And he just said to me, just pray for wisdom. For some reason, I was like, okay, well, not as deep as I thought, but I would hang on to that. And yeah. I set an alarm on my phone, uh, on, uh, on my laptop, that gave me, it, 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 every 6 a.m., it would say, pray for wisdom. Wow. And every morning, I will pray for wisdom. Oh. Actually, as I started my day, I was like, God, please give me wisdom. Give me, because wisdom will give you ideas. Mm-hmm. It would mm-hmm. give you clarity. Mm-hmm. It would unbundle complex situations mm-hmm. for you. You would have foresight. You know like what I mean? And honestly, honestly, I think I only lost a task in the 12 weeks I was in the show once, and that was the wow. first week. My team won every other task. It was so crazy that even we sold a car, and they would give you um, assignments that you had to accomplish within 48 to 72, so 48 to, uh, 72 hours. In some days, two days, you had two days to finish the task. Mm. You can you imagine selling a car in two days? Like you it was crazy. Go out you had to go out, you had to sell, you had to use your network. And yeah. it was just God working. And that's why I want to give a shout out to the other second person that I mentioned earlier. Her name is Joa. Mm-hmm. Joa was amazing. Joa literally held my hand throughout that time. My friend, we've known each other from primary school. And we were coincidentally doing heaven together for the product oh. on the product side. So she was, while I was in, she was running the NAVDAC thing uh, outside. But then she was just like, whenever I needed any support from outside for the show, that's who I went to. That was my go to person. In fact, it was her mom that bought the car. Wow. Because her mom was just in the market to buy a car at that time. So oh, we now marketed wow. the thing that said, okay, I already had the money. So we just say, God just sort of lined up everything. So by the time we got to finale, you know, the judges unanimously, you know, uh, picked me on the, the live finale as the winner. Uh, I had lost like two dress sizes by the time I got to that 12th week because, man, that show was hectic. But it was, I had learned a whole lot. I mm. think it shaped me significantly to the leader and even the entrepreneur that I am today. I can't even discountenance the network that I formed, both from my fellow contestants mm-hmm. and most especially the judges. the judges. Yeah, that's when I really became close to Tony Cole, uh, Kiari Buka. These are people that if I need anything today, I can you know, reach out to them. Dr. Jumoke, that was when we met. Oh. She, was a, she was a judge on the show. And uh, since then, I haven't let go of her skits. I've been holding it tightly since then. You know, she's been an awesome mentor as well. Yeah. So. Do you think like budding entrepreneurs should try to get into like shows oh, yes. like that? Oh yes, certainly. And the show is already, I think it's in its 10th or 11th year mm-hmm. now. And mm-hmm. the prices of course keep evolving. I think this year, I think it's like 20M or something or 10M and something, you know. And for me, it's just the fact that if you're able to make it in, because so many thousands of people, you know, um, put in for the show and thousands of people audition. 
Yeah. So does the fact that you even make it through, it already pushes you because you have to prepare, you have to think about your business plan, mm-hmm. you have to think about what is the unique selling point. It's almost like you're approaching an investor. So it yeah. prepares you for a lot of things in your business life beyond just uh, winning. Mm-hmm. You know, it equips you. And then you meet other entrepreneurs along the journey that could now end up being most of my contestants uh, from then are still close we're still close to today you know we're off doing different things in their various walks of life but at least there are contacts that we have and who have now even you know become very uh, people very relevant in society so the network you can't underestimate it so it shouldn't just be about winning the ultimate prize because it can only be one winner yeah. but there are other opportunities to win along the way true if you open your eyes and you take advantage of them Got it. So how many businesses do you have under your belt right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. So I have Heaven, which uh, which has salons and also has a product line. I have the Blaze Training Center, which is a fully equipped training center in yeah. Port Harcourt. Um, I also have an event on that manages an event hall as well called the Event Hub. I, have, I still have my uh, logistics company running, but not as uh, not on the scale that it was before. But mm-hmm. at least you know doing deliveries. We just some customers we just couldn't let go, so mm-hmm. we're still supporting them from a logistics standpoint. I have uh, t- two supermarkets now in Lagos. Oh really? Wow. Yes. Um, you want to you want to mention their names? Yeah, Jan and Jaya's. Jan and Jaya's is in uh, VI, in 1004 specifically. So please, hey, check us out if you're, you happen to be in check Lagos. Please and go Jaya's. and check out Jan and Jaya's. Named after my daughters. Oh, it's wow. in the same complex with the Med Plus and the Chinese restaurant, right opposite the Cluster A gates. It's the only one in 1004. Mm, and one. then now we're just opening one in collaboration with the Navy in Navy Town Barracks. Nice. So that should come on stream by the end of September. So I'm quite excited about that one. Because I've been working on it quietly for a while and at least we're almost there. Um, and, so, so, and you know, we plan to continue to expand. Mm. Then of course I have my regular job, uh, STARS, where I'm MD CEO. I uh, manage the affairs, the vessel logistics company. We provide services to oil companies. So we have 11 vessels working with Total and Chevron. We work offshore. Uh, then we have the security company, which I'm a director in. Uh, we have over 500, 600 guards working in um, Potakot and in, um, in Benin as well, hoping to expand to other states. Beautiful. So, so. Come to all that. But have you ever started like a business or a project that failed before? Mm-hmm. How did you handle it? Yes, I have. I, I was out for the pre. Okay, so my logistics business. Mm. I went in very bullishly. I had a vision. I went with technology. I went to the large fleet. I had 10 bikes. You know, all my riders had, had smartphones. They had headpieces. They had, they had know, kits. I think I saw, everything. I saw yeah. that. Well, like yeah, I was really... Kitted. And I had, a, a, I had a portal where you could order, you could order your rides, mm. you could order your deliveries, and um, you could even track the riders so you could see where they were. Mm. I was wondering, but I fell flat on my face because I didn't mitigate the risk of the political risk. Mm. which came with the policy that um, the government now passed and that led to the grounding of that kind of business for almost a year. Yeah. And that sort of knocked a lot of people out of business. And even just, because your customers now found an alternative. They found a different way. Yeah. So by the time you're even coming on stream, you just, you know, weren't as relevant as at that time during COVID where it seemed like the, Mm -hmm. um, the, Mm -hmm. was the uh, delivery option of choice. Yeah, so that business, I struggled. I, I lost, I lost my investment. To be honest, I really lost my investment because that whole time that the bikes were down. But I mean, bikes are not assets that you mm-hmm. just abandon mm-hmm. for a long time and stuff. So it was a learning point for me not to just jump. You know, like I was passionate about it. I wanted to diversify, and then I just jumped without really doing very extensive uh, due diligence. It was a real miss, uh, hit or miss. That was a miss. Mm. That was a miss for me. Um, yeah, and I will not be going back. I don't think I'll go you back. Think, you don't think you're playing logistics basically? No, no, I don't think so. Not, not at that level. If I'm going to play in logistics, it will be more high level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, something that can surmount, that, you know, can surmount uh, those type of risks that can be properly insulated from mm-hmm. certain risks, but not, uh, not, not the bikes. Yeah. How did you handle it though? I mean, you just started something that failed. I mean, um, so I, I felt bad. But just, I have a principle in my life. It's the way that I live my life. I don't, I try, I try very hard not to live a life of regrets. Mm. Just personal, personal, um, personal decision. So I, I, I take ownership of my choices and my decisions, good or bad. Mm. So when I do something and there's a bad consequence, I'm able to own it because I know that uh, I made the choice. 
um, so I don't blame other people for how things have turned out for me or how things have, um, I, you know, whether there's a negative uh, impact. Yeah. So I wallow maybe for, for a while and then I come out and I say, okay, what have you learned from this experience? And, and do you try to do better, you know, do, do it differently? So yes, I felt bad, but I didn't sit and then it didn't set me back. Like I didn't, you know, now say I'm never going to do business again. I never, no, I'll just say I'll do it again, but I'll do it differently. And maybe not in this sector and mm. all of that, you know, so. So you really sold the bikes and Yes, all I that. sold off all the bikes. I think we have only one or two actually, which we use interchangeably. Like I said, we just service a few of our old customers. And there's mm. one of my riders that had been with me for a while. And I really, he needed, I knew he needed something to keep doing. So and when the ban was lifted, he was still available. I said, okay, sure, just come in. So my accountant runs our business, and they, I mean, it's just for them, really. So I'm not doing it, it's now like almost like a CSR, that's what yeah. I'm concerned, you know. I'm doing it to just for, the guy has a salary, sort of income, and then my that's accountant. Beautiful, account. actually. Yeah. So, uh, the office space, did you get an office space for it as well? So they're sharing, they're using the same premises where Heaven is, that's where we keep the bike, um, and that's where he reports to, and then he launches from there. You know, the person who manages his uh, rides is also working out of the Blaze Training Center. So we just try to use the resources we have without incurring more overhead costs. Mm. Good. So being an entrepreneur and running different businesses over the years, what would you say has been the top skills that have helped you navigate this journey? Mm, top skill, discipline. You know, self-discipline. A lot of business owners don't have self-discipline. Mm. And what do I mean by self-discipline? So discipline in various forms. Discipline in the sense of, let's come from a financial perspective. You know, being able to separate your money from your business company's money. You know, people struggle with that. Mm. So um, people make personal payments through their company accounts. It's actually bad. You're stealing from your business. Mm. Let your business pay you a salary. Then from your salary, you can do whatever you want. You know, it's better that way. It looks better. Do you know that now, if I want to take money from Heaven, for anything, even though I've invested so much money in Heaven, I actually have to justify it to my accountant that I'm drawing, withdrawing a millionaire, and this is as a refund for XYZ that I did with my funds, which you yeah. verify. So, but it's my company. I can just go and be taking out money anyhow but i have to be accountable to the business because the business has employees you know um that it's responsible for do you pay yourself so, a salary from heaven yes mm. i have a salary mm. and when i'm able to draw it i do draw it down mm. when i'm not able to draw it i leave it and then when they're able to draw, pay me then they pay me that's the only way so i think self-discipline has really helped me and then you know uh to separate my own personal lifestyle from my business so that my business can continue to grow thrive and expand mm -hmm. and one of the reasons why i'm also able to do that is because i have a job mm -hmm. i have a job that pays me so i can afford for my business to breathe but when you start off a business and you're not giving it that gestation period time when it can grow without your even trying to draw a salary from it then you start to stifle the business and the business might not work out because they are waiting for you to pay you back, but they can't pay you yet. But you have to survive. But if you have another source of income, then you're able to survive on your other source of income whilst your business is able to just continue to plow back its earnings into it so it will grow, expand to the point where you can now survive from it. You know. Um, so I think self-discipline has, um, has really been a skill that I have. Then the ability to manage people. Mm. I mean, if you look at the salon space, when you have staff that are, my salon business has been in existence for about eight years now. Mm -hmm. And I have staff that have been with me from day one. Oh. Yes. The very first person I employed, April 2015, he still works with me. He's actually a general manager, he's a director in the business. Beautiful. He has shares. Beautiful. Um, I have my breeders, nail technicians who have been with me since 2015. 2016, 2017, and they're still there. It's not, it's really unheard of. In fact, now I take them and I use them to open up new branches. Oh, wow. You know, so I think that if your ability to understand um, human beings and how you manage, not easy. Mm. Um, finding a good balance has also been a skill set that has worked for me. Uh, and I'm still talking about discipline. I take bank loans. Mm. I've grown all of my businesses through bank loans. Wow. I established my supermarket through bank loans. I moved to Lagos, salon through bank loans. Expanded to my second and third branches through bank loans. Don't you think that's risky? Yep. Because it pays back. In fact, the banks are happy to give it to me because mm -hmm. my business paper. That's what I talked about, discipline. Mm. You will be afraid to take a bank loan because you're not sure. That means you don't have confidence in the business. I didn't take mm. a bank loan from day one. Mm. Don't forget that salons have been in existence for eight years now. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there was already a proof of concept. You already mm. know what your cash flow looks like, you know, mm -hmm. what your expense layout looks mm -hmm. like before you decide, okay, I'm going to go and take a loan. So you take a loan to the point where you know that you can, the business can pay pay it back yeah. and pays back every month and we never default 
This but I've been able to, but, if, but my business has been able to grow. Because if I try to generate all them, I will never have all them unless I'm going to go and steal it mm. or do runs to get it. <laughs> yeah. So if, if I cannot do any of those two things, then I have what to. What amount of runs is going to get you the kind, kind of, of money you know, that you need <laughs> to be able to keep expanding? I'm expanding mm. quite rapidly. So mm. um, I have, at least GTB has been a very supportive bank for me. Beautiful. Yeah. And they've supported every, all my expansions there. GTB has been right there. You know, so I shout out to Josephine. Shout out, shout out to GTB, of yeah. GTB. She's constantly supporting GTB, yeah. all my expansion dreams. She she's not, she says I'm a dreamer and she's always there to you see her name Josephine Joseph supporting a dream, fellow dreamer, <laughs> you know. So just amazing. So I think if you're able to really discipline is at the core. It mm. helps you even the way you manage your business, the way you manage your personnel, and the way you're able to grow if mm. you have that discipline. So it's a bedrock quality, I think, that one every business leader should develop. You're a mother of twin babies right now. Yes. Shout out to the, Jana and Jaya. Shout out to Jana and Jaya. Jana and Jaya. <laughs> <laughs> did, did pregnancy, childbirth, how did it affect you and your business? That was when I knew that I had structure. I'm sure mm. you've heard a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs, people that are listening to your show, yeah. must have been inundated with the concept of structure. Yeah, structure, structure. Yeah, so that was a real test of whether I had structure because I was out of the country for four months. Mm. My kids were born, came early. They came unexpected, mm. uh, unexpectedly early. So I had an emergency cesarean section and they were in intensive care units for weeks and that delayed our ability to come back as when we had hoped we would come back. Mm. So I was out of the country unplanned for four, for four months. months. And that was in 2017. Mm. And in that year, we expanded. We expanded into to two locations in that year. In that year of 2017, where out of the 12 months, I was out for four months. Mm. The business expanded to our second branch and then moved to our HQ, which is the, our big... Jerry. Yes, because we were in Vineyard, 50 square meter space. And then we moved to the duplex mm. um, in, 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 uh, on, on Air Road mm -hmm. in 2017. All of that, I mean, that was the year I had the kids. That was the year I was out for four months. There was no way I could have done that if I didn't have proper structure, if I didn't have good personnel, you know, who had bought and caught my vision and were able to run even without me being there. So I think that for me, pregnancy and, um, you know, uh, giving birth mm -hmm. was just an episode in my life. Mm. It wasn't a, a pause. It wasn't a full stop. It wasn't a, a, a diversion. So you're able to work while heavily yeah. pregnant? Yeah. Rely on my workers. My business was even growing. Like I just said to you, we expanded. So mm. I wasn't worried about sales. Oh, your sales are dropping because you're not there. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. they were recording mm -hmm. sales that they hadn't ever recorded before. Oh. While I was away. So put your structure in place. Put your systems and your processes in place. And use technology. So how has motherhood been so far? I mean, you went from not having kids to now having people that you have to be there for every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I love my children. Mm. I absolutely, completely, totally besotted with my kids. Did you ever think you would have twins? Nope. Is that something you, I you thought, always I actually wanted? thought I would have three kids. Mm -hmm. And I had their names already. And mm -hmm. they were all going to be J names, Jasmine, Jason. I thought I would have a boy somewhere in the mix. Um, but God, you know, is the author of everything. Mm. And he knows the end from the beginning. And I believe that this is how he ordained it to be. Maybe he looked at me and saw that with where I want to take you to, one, it would be best for you to have one pregnancy in your lifetime and just give you two kids. And I'll give you the, the ability to be content with those two, <laughs> you know, so that you can move on to do the, achieve the things that are so destined you have for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That ship has, uh, has, in fact, the ship has sunk. It has not only sailed, it has, in fact, it has sunk to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> the ship has sunk. I mean, the I mean ship is you, can never, you can never tell. No, 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 I can't tell. I am not having any more children. I'm very clear about that. I have full, full definitive clarity. I'm looking into the camera and saying, yes, I will not be having any more children. Please hold me to that in 10 years. I'm almost 40. What am I looking for? I have two beautiful kids. I'm 38. I know. So, what am I, what are they find again? Am I looking for a boy? Am I a boy? <laughs> I've accomplished. I have two beautiful, very smart and intelligent girls mm -hmm. who I see that their future is very bright. Um, and I believe that God has equipped me to be able to pour all that I have into them, at least by his grace. And um, I, think, uh, I think I'm sufficient with, the, with the Jana and Jaya. Uh, motherhood is not easy, you mm -hmm. know, because you have to balance 
I have to balance all the things I do. And you've talked a lot about what I do, so you can yeah. imagine how do you mix all of that with being a mother, mm. and not just a mother of one child, a mother, mother two, of two, two kids, kids, very active and children, twins. yeah, very active. Um, so a couple of things I'd say is that I have. Um, um, I started first by learning to forgive myself. So mm-hmm. I forgive. I learned how to forgive myself a long time. So I like to share that with like new mothers who are career um, oriented or business oriented and really don't want to choose. If you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so I tell them you have to forgive yourself in advance because it's the guilt that kills you. Mm-hmm. It's the guilt of leaving your four months old to go travel for a meeting and you feel like it's highly irresponsible of you. And how do you, how do you how can you do that? And this is you judging yourself, not necessarily even other people judging you, but you know it's reality. So if you learn how to forgive yourself, then you you embrace other aspects. You embrace the help of other people. Mm-hmm. You embrace mm-hmm. the fact that there's community that they will be raised by a village. Yeah. And you allow that village to help you raise them so mm-hmm. that you can also achieve your own fullest potential. Mm-hmm. Because what gives them pride is not just your being with them 24/7, but it's also you achieving and chasing your dreams True. and your goals. True. That's also what adds to the pride of your child mm-hmm. um, not sacrificing them so uh, so I say forgive yourself I learned how to forgive myself early on I also learned quickly that there's nothing like a work-life balance so I don't look for it mm. I don't try to find balance it doesn't exist mm. so I use always use an analogy of, uh, of, of how all our goals or our tasks or things that are in front of us can take the shape of two kinds of things either a glass ball or a plastic ball mm. And most times, these this balls, these things, tax, whether it's family, work, um, um, societal commitments, they're all jung- juggling in the air like balls. Yeah. And at every given point in time, they take the form of a gas ball or they take the form of a, of a plastic ball. Mm. So the question is, you have to, what the skill is not in trying to balance all the balls because you're never going to balance it. Yeah. The fact that I'm here with you right now, something is suffering. Mm-hmm, my mm-hmm. kids are on holiday. I could have been spending this time with them. Mm-hmm. I could have been in my office or any of my business locations, but I'm here. Yeah. So this, was, for me, had become a glass ball because we had moved it and moved it. It became essential that I should be here. Mm-hmm. So those other things, I looked at them and said, okay, they are plastic balls. And what I, why are they plastic balls? They're plastic balls that they drop because I've dropped the fact that I'm not with my kids, but I can bounce back because I can pick it up in the evening when mm-hmm. I get back. Mm-hmm. I still have tomorrow and I have Sunday with them, right? and there's no real critical emergency that requires me to be with them right now yeah. same thing will work i have answered my emails i have juggled and shifted things around that nothing is a glass ball so they're all plastic i can reschedule them and take them pick them up at another time but imagine that i have a very important meeting with total right now and i'm here with you that's a glass ball, that's a glass ball. it drops it shatters mm-hmm. i can never recover it can mm-hmm. never bounce back because maybe a decision will have been taken in my absence that could cost my company yep. a lot of money yeah. or reputation or whatever the case mm-hmm. is. So it's a glass ball. And this could have been a, it was a, it would have been a plastic ball in the face in, of that yep, other thing yep, yep. because I, I could mean, always be shadow with you and say, okay, this is not an emergency. Um, Joseph, can we take, pick this up on Saturday? Mm-hmm. So the ability to sort of look at all these um, responsibilities and commitments that we have in our lives and be able to define when they become a glass ball or when they are a plastic ball and then realize the ones that can drop because like I said they will balls will drop the question is is it a plastic ball that will drop and can bounce back and you pick it back up or is it a glass ball that drops and once it hits the ground it shatters a family commitment that you know that if you don't make it it has devastating consequences but you choose work that could have been rescheduled over it that becomes a glass ball that falls to the ground and True. causes cracks in the family True. So that's so that's what I that's how I define my so that's how I, I view that makes my, a lot of sense. my work life experience through those lens, right? And that's how uh, I've been able to sort of balance that. And same time, I come with that approach to my kids. And they're also quite independent. And I think growing up with a mother like me, they've learned to not be clingy. Yes, they miss me when I travel. I try to stay in touch, but at least they understand. I'm very honest with them. We sit down. We have proper conversations. They mm. know that mommy has to work. They know they understand the value of money. They understand the value of working. Why they have to go to school? Why I have to go to work? Um, and uh, and I, and I, I try to find a balance, not take advantage of their understanding nature. But at the same time, you know they're independent. They can take care of themselves. They can be alone. They're not whining. Oh, you know, holding my dress when I'm leaving and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I have grown independent women. <laughs> Beautiful. Do you have a book written already? No, I do not. You should write one. Come on. You have a lot to share. Yeah, and so we thank God for your show and your podcast that's given me the opportunity to, you know, express myself and share my voice. Yeah, Uh, maybe one day I will. 
Maybe one day I will. I mean, 40 is around the corner. It could be mm. a good project. Maybe you should, you should just drop one. It could be 40. a good project. Who yeah. knows? You're just giving me an idea. I'll look at it. I'll look at it. Great. So let's talk about Stars Investments Company for a bit. You play in the maritime space now. Did you ever see yourself filling those shoes you feel now? No, I never. I always assumed that, you know, it would be my, for my brothers. Because mm. I have an older brother who's a marine engineer um, by training, working with NLNG. So, t t so technically, he had told the path of my dad, yeah. you know, verbatim. So I assumed that, you know, that company would be for him. And that's why I went about focused on building my own business, mm -hmm. and doing my own thing and having my own dreams and my own vision and my own focus. I never anticipated that I would be called upon to, uh, to, to take on the family business. I remember I watched an interview uh, where they asked you if you'd ever do the Stars Investment Company. I, 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 no, that's for my brother. Oh, okay. You, you watched that? <laughs> that must have been right after the next title, I'm sure. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't see that. That wasn't in my sight at all. It wasn't. I never, I didn't, I didn't angle for it. I think even leading up to 2014, if you had asked me to tell you clearly what Stars Investment did, I actually probably wouldn't have been able to articulate it properly. Mm. I kind of knew that, yeah, they're into like the vessel thing, but I couldn't tell you anything about their fleet. Yeah. I couldn't tell you about what the, you know, what the operations were like. I really couldn't because I didn't have, a, I didn't have a focus. I didn't have an interest. I had never really paid attention because I just felt, oh, that's for the boys. Um, so it was, it was a surprise to be, um, you know, to be fingered as um, being qualified to take on the role for succession yeah. in the business at that time, continuing where the business was and they were trying to attract international funding mm -hmm. and the funders really wanted to see a clear path of succession for yeah. the business, given the age of the founder, who's my dad. Um, and I just, you know, and the, the consultants that were recruited to um, source for this succession, success or whatever, put the succession plan in place, had an opportunity to interact with me. Then I was running the uh, security company. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with them, and when I, apparently when I walked out of the room, they said to my dad, "That's your successor right there." My dad is like, "Her? No, she's mixing hair cream. <laughs> no, she, no, 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 no. Have you met my son? When you meet my son, you know that uh, you have met." So, no, no, no. My dad was actually also in denial for months mm -hmm. because I was also wasn't in his sights as well. I don't think he envisioned that I would be the choice um, at all, too. Um, but they said to him, one very critical comment that also has stayed with me over the years and I, I think kind of keeps me an anchor um, when it even gets a bit tough is what your business needs is not a technical mind, it needs a business mind. Mm. And that was what they said to him. So it's True. not really about the technical expertise. She might have never, she might not be able to tell the aft from the um, port of, uh, starboard or port of the ship, but she has the business mind and she's visionary in her thinking. So she'll be able to keep your vision alive, keep your legacy alive, and that's what we want. And that's why uh, they pushed and pushed, and then I attended a meeting with him, with those same funders, and I guess my performance at the meeting was very um, impressive, because mm. then that's when he was won so over. Okay. He's like, okay, maybe these guys have a point. And even the funders were like, oh, we look forward to, forward to working okay. with her on the management team. And that was, um, and that, that, that was like the beginning of uh, the rest of the story, and here we are. I was uh, nine, nine years, yeah, nine years later. How, how did you fit in? Because it wasn't your thing before. No, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of aspects that would have been scary. Mm -hmm. First being that uh, I was young. I was less than 30 when I um, came into the business. And I came in as number two. Uh, so I had a lot of older people working in the company who were much older than I was, who had worked for, obviously, much longer than I had worked in a structured environment. This was actually my first structured employment, mm. you know, because I had been running my business myself, and I had also I'd done, done some work in America, you know, after my first degree, but just for a year, you know. So in terms of being an adult, I hadn't really worked in an, a structured organization. So I think there was a fear for me as to whether I would have the competence to fit into the role. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I had been working in the security company. I'd been running it um, for about four, four years at that time. But I mean, I was still at the helm of affairs and trying to also navigate that and learn things myself. Um, so I had that fear. And then of course, how would I, I wanted to, I wanted to be deserving of the leadership. Mm. I didn't want to be followed because, I, because of my last name mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or because of who I was to the owner of the company. I wanted people to feel that I deserved to be followed, yeah. uh, to be listened to, uh, and, 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 and you know, and to join my team. So I needed to earn their respect, uh, 
and I just had to prove myself. So those were the kind of pressures that I had going in into the business. And I mean, I think looking back, I managed to galvanize the workforce. I mean, I was very impatient. I was young, so I, you know, I struggled with things like impatience at the early stages. But my dad was a fantastic mentor. Mm. He, was very pa- he was very patient. He was very understanding. Like, don't worry, I was once your age. I understand, but my job here now is to mentor you, hold your hand, and help you grow. Mm. And he did a great job. I think when I look at myself today, I would say that he, he did a great job. So shout out to Daddy. <laughs> shout out to Daddy, Daddy Greg. Daddy yeah, Greg, right. Greg, thank you so much for your leadership. But yeah, um, so and I think they say like they say the story. The rest was history. We were here came in as executive director, and then after a year of proving myself, became chief operating officer. And did that for another six years, and then chairman, him CEO, resi- um, he retired mm. at the age of seventy, uh, and then recommended me for CEO. So I had done about seven years by the time I became CEO. Beautiful. We Thank are we are, we are done now. <laughs> Last question: What would be your advice to budding entrepreneurs, people who are they just have a business idea right now, they are looking to start, and let's say they come to you for advice. What, what are the top three things you advise them to do? Yeah, so interesting. I, mean, I had a few of those from um, Priya's uh, the She Entrepreneur mm-hmm. pitch. Uh, pitch at all. I, I ended up mentoring a couple of the uh, of the um, applicants yeah. uh, who didn't win, uh, and, and you know, trying to help them stay on the right path. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what I would say to you is, start small. I know that it sounds really cliche, but I find that other people underestimate um, the power of just starting mm-hmm. where they are. We, we think that we always have to have all the ducks lined up in a row. We have to have all the ingredients to start the soup. We can start boiling water. We can start peeling uh, the um, yam. We can start chopping the onions that is there. You know, mm. you can start. Mm. You don't have to wait till everything has arrived mm. and then you now get, you know, you get, you get going. So there's something in your hand, you know, start, st- ask yourself, how can I develop this thing that's in my hand first yeah. to the point where I can either get, you know, um, other people to buy into it to be convinced in it and then support me with it. also don't underestimate the power of relationships and connections mm. so everything is not really just about money true you want to print a shirt I, I want to you want shirts or something i can call somebody because you know me i have somebody that has a printing press i can call the person to help you print the shirt true. and even if i want to buy that i'll pay you in two months but mm. i have that relationship that mm. you don't have mm-hmm. you will never have gotten that credit mm-hmm. or you can pay them in six months i will get that credit for you on your behalf yeah. because of connection because of relationship mm-hmm. so at that point as a body body entrepreneur you must invest in relationship because it costs you nothing mm. to grow relationships so you're not saying i don't have money growing and building relationships is not dependent on whether you have money it's about attitude right so that was my attitude right now Yes, is, I mean, you're doing well, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say to them, um, you know, start where you are. See how that idea can be consummated at that point. Mm. Don't look for 10 million naira. I mean, why do you want to take a risk with 10 million naira and someone else's money as well? True. Yeah, it went off for, for an unproven idea. Mm. So start off first, make it a proven, a, a proven concept. And then, and I always say to people that money will always chase value. It's one of my favorite lines mm. money will always chase value so don't be concerned about the money yet be more concerned about the value add of that thing you want to do is it going to add value and mm. you sometimes we too we get carried away with what we like true what you like might not be what the market wants true so it's not really about what you like i mean i like a sequin dress but maybe that's <laughs> not what's in <laughs> market does not like sequin dress they like velvet clothes mm. you don't like velvet clothes but the market likes it mm-hmm. so we need to learn how to drown our own personal influences mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and try mm-hmm. to be driven by what what the market is demanding for. So, so that'll be my the end of the day, they are the ones that are paying. Not They're so. the ones that are gonna pay, <laughs> and then you are gonna get paid that mm-hmm, way. Mm-hmm. So, so that'll be my 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 words of advice. Too. Beautiful. I mean, there's there's still a whole lot to talk about, but time is racing fast against us right yes. now. I have to thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for not holding back actually so you know some people may come here sometimes and they're like, they're like reserved they're like held back but you you pour this out so thank you thank you for being here and once again guys thank you for sticking with us till the end 
make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel it will not cost you anything subscribe like okay. the video like the video <laughs> okay make an episode the most watched episode <laughs> <laughs> make right. us trend please <laughs> well, i'll see you guys in the next episode take care of yourself and bye bye everybody